Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, this is your word. This is not mine. We are here before you. So we ask you, talk to us. Speak to us, to our heart, to our minds, to our soul. Give us this solid food, this great example. We ask for transformation in our heart, in our lives, our families, and our church. Bless us through this word. This is what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, today we are starting a new sermon series. This will be four Sundays talking about our calling to serve. Uh, the pastors and the board are working to restructure the ministry of deacons and deaconesses in our church. And it's okay if you don't know what this means. Maybe if you don't have the habit to come and to attend the church, these two words are very, very strange. Deacons. What is this? And deaconesses. So I'd like to start. So first of all, we have this uh, booklet uh, in our uh, welcome uh, table and this is a, like a, a guide for this series. We will discuss this in our connecting groups this month. So if you want, it's for free. You can take one. Even our uh, word today, we have a handout there. Okay, So this is for you. So let's come back here uh, and talk a little bit about deacons. This is actually uh, a Greek word. There's a Greek word called diakonos. And this word in Greek, this Greek word means agent, assistant, minister, servant. And although there is a specific uh, meaning of this word, when we talk about deacons and deaconesses. This is a very common word, and there's a broad sense of this word in the New Testament. Uh, we find many, many texts with this word, including the text we just read. Uh, for example, you can see, I will read the text again, but I will replace the words where we find this word diaconos in the original Greek. Whoever would be great among you must be your deacon. This is what we find in the uh, original, in, in Greek. Even as the Son of Man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As you can see, this is the broad sense of this word. The pa uh, pastor Mark Dever, uh, pastor of one of the biggest churches in the U.S., he says, Jesus presented himself as a type of deacon. And the Bible presents Christians as deacons of Christ or his gospel. So the apostles are depicted as deacons, and Paul regularly refers to himself and to those who worked with him as deacons. He refers to himself as a deacon 
among the Gentiles. Paul calls Timothy a deacon of Christ. And Peter says that the Old Testament prophets were deacons to us Christians. The Bible also calls angels deacons. And Satan too has his deacons. So this word is a very common word in the New Testament. And I'd like to talk to you today the first word here in this series about this broad sense saying that this is maybe the, the, the great lesson today, but for me, it's the first one in this text, that every disciple is a deacon. Because every disciple is called to minister, to be a servant. A deacon is a servant. And what we find in these words here is the truth that every single disciple should consider themselves as deacons, as servants. This is the first lesson we have here. Jesus says, whoever, every Christian is a deacon. There are two distinctions that we see today in the church. Not necessarily here, but every place, everywhere. And these two distinctions are about clergy versus laity and sacred versus secular. It's very common to understand the world through these two distinctions, contrasts. However, we should break this barrier, this distinction. Maybe we should unprofessionalize, this is a very difficult word, unprofessionalize the ministry of the church. And we also should make vocation sacred. It's common to say pastor, oh, clergy, minister sacred. Uh, a lawyer? Oh, no, secular. Uh, it's not ministry. It's just a job. We should invert this. And we should understand that everyone at the church is a minister. And when you go to your job, you are also a minister there at your job, at your workplace. Usually we have a tiny group doing all the job at the church and a huge group just watching. This tiny group doing the job. And we like to think about this because at the Bible, in the New Testament, every disciple is a minister, is a servant. This is the first lesson we find here in this text. But there is more. The second lesson we see here is that service is the measure of maturity. We should understand that. Jesus is saying, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Let's understand here the context where Jesus is talking, is saying this. Jesus is going, heading to Jerusalem. He knows that very soon he will be betrayed and he will be killed at the cross. He is going to Jerusalem and he is looking to the cross. And then two of his disciples, James and John, they come to him and they, they make a request. You can find this request 
in verse 37. Jesus, please grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Wow. They want the best spot. They say to Jesus, hey Jesus, I don't know what you are looking for, but we are looking, aiming for glory and honor. And then Jesus answered, hey, verse 38, you do not know what you are asking. Jesus is very clear. Hey, you, you don't understand what I am trying to say to you. They were going to Jerusalem, and while Jesus was looking to the cross, they were looking for honor and glory. And more than that, the Gospel of Luke says that, verse, uh, Luke 22 says that a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Let's discuss here in the group of the disciples. Who of us is the greater? Then Jesus will say, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. Jesus is saying that the measure of maturity, greatness, is service. You want to be great? Serve. It's interesting that this has lots of implications to us. Let's make a comparison with our lives. Imagine a baby, maybe a one, two months, uh, two month baby. The first phase in our lives, we need milk. Is it right? This is a very common scene. Milk. And then we grow. We start to grow. And then we have baby food. Maybe something more solid. Right? And then we grow. And then what happened? We start to self-feeding. Right? We start eating by ourselves. It's a mess, I know, when we start. But the fact is that we start eating by ourselves. And then we grow. And then we reach, maybe in our uh, teenagers, teenage independence. We, starting, we start cooking. We can produce food for ourselves. Because until now, our mom, our dad, they needed to give us food. And then we become mature. And when we become mature, what happens? We start feeding someone else. See that life is in this way. We, the greater, serves the lesser, not the opposite. It's very interesting to think about that because our goal as a church is not simply give food to you, but our goal is to mature you in order that you will be able to feed others. In this sense, the best church is not the one that offers the best services, but the one that offers the best opportunities to serve. Think with me. Uh, I think I have mentioned this uh, example here to you. This is from a book written by James Boyce. He was a uh, Presbyterian pastor in the U.S., and he mentions this church 
that it started a new uh, evening service and they were advertising this service and then they made a pamphlet saying 10 reasons to visit our Sunday evening service and then the 10 reasons are first one the air conditioning feels great second coffee and goodies for everyone after every service three the music is upbeat and easy to sing four you get to meet some really neat people five the sermon is always relevant to everyday life six you can sleep in on Sundays and still make it to church on time seven child care and children's church are provided eight very important free parking nine you can go to the shore for the weekend and still make it to church on Sunday night and ten you will discover an awesome God who cares about you okay beautiful however this is maybe an ad of a religious service, a uh, opportunity people have to consume religion. But the real church that Jesus was intended to prepare was not just a church where you get everything good, where you find the best plates and the best food. No. The real church is the, the best church is the church that offers to you opportunities to grow in order that you be able to serve others. The question is not necessarily what you are, what are you eating, but who are you feeding? It's important to understand that today we live a crisis. There is a consumeristic approach in many churches. This is a great temptation for us. And the data is very, very stressful. I don't know about uh, if you know this survey, but 75% of our kids will leave the church between 18 and 29 years old. 75%. And then you can think, oh, so we need then provide a good youth minister. We will look for the best youth pastor for our church. Are we right? No, we are wrong. Why are we wrong? Because this survey focused not on the reasons they left, they leave the church. But the reason why the 25 stayed at the church. Do you know why the youth stay at the church? Do you know? There are five reasons here. It's very small, so I'll read to you. Number one, they ate dinner five to seven nights a week as a family. They have a good family time together. Number two, they serve with their families in a ministry at the church. They are not consumers. They are providers. They have responsibilities at the body. Number three, they had one spiritual experience in the home during the week. They, they have spiritual experience not only at the church but at home as well. Number four, Entrusted with responsibility in ministry at an early age. And I remember that when I was planting a church in Rio years ago. By the way, Pastor Jaime, today, I, I am very glad because he was preaching today in the church where I planted in Rio. Uh, beautiful. And, you know, when we plant a church, we don't have many resources. We do everything. 
So I remember that I used to go there and we, I have conversations with Juliana about our daughters, Gabriela and Rebecca. They were very young. And I thought, hey, Juliana, how, how, these will, how will you handle this? Because we don't have many options, many friends. We have maybe two or three kids here in our uh, new church. And then Gabriela, I remember, she was responsible to give the informative, the bulletin. Every time this size, she was at the door giving the bulletin. This was her job. And he was very, very professional. Good evening. Good evening. She was trained to go to the church, not to consume, but to serve, to give. Sometimes we think that the best thing we have to do is to sit in the pill and receive a good, solid food. But the great intention here is to make you strong, an adult to serve. And the fifth, they had a, at least one faith-focused adult in their lives other than their parents. They had mentors. People who were one-to-one -one discipling them. Then they stayed. It's interesting. We need to think about that. Service is the measure of maturity. Think about that. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And then the third and last lesson we have here. If the service is the measure of maturity... Jesus, the third lesson, Jesus is the measure of service. Because we should understand service not in our terms, but in Jesus. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And then Jesus says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, hey, you are my disciples. You should follow me. Follow my example. And let me show you something. Jesus is giving here not only good words, but he will give to his disciples a great example. No words, just a great example. You remember this example. When Jesus... As soon as he enters Jerusalem, he goes to the upper room, and the first, very first thing that he does there is to wash his disciples' feet. You know very well that this was a very humiliating thing that time. It was a slave job. There is no record of any disciple washing the feet of his master. So a master, a rabbi, washing the feet of his disciples is something astonishing, unthinkable. This is extreme humiliation. But then... When we think about the circumstances that Jesus did this, we are even more astonished. So, the questions, the question here for us to think very quickly, what are the circumstances in which Jesus washed his disciples' feet? feet? Because when you go to John chapter 13, Jesus starts washing the feet of his disciples on verse 5. But from verses 1 to 4, we have the frame, the scene of the circumstances where Jesus washed his feet. Their feet, sorry. So the first circumstance, very quickly, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out 
of this world to the Father. John is saying that. The first aspect. Jesus knew that this was his last night. Tomorrow is my dead, my death. Tomorrow we'll, we'll meet with the cross. And I don't know about you, but if I knew that this was my last preaching, my last day of life, probably, I would not be here concerning concerned about others. I would take care about me. Maybe I would be suffering myself and thinking about me. Someone, please come to, com to comfort me. But Jesus is different. There is something absolutely astonishing about Jesus. You know that when Jesus was on the cross, we have seven words. Jesus spoke seven times. And the first three times he spoke. Take a look at that. Number one. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He was concerned about not himself, but about the soldiers. They were crucifying him. But they, Jesus was concerned about them. The second word to the criminal just beside. Truly I say to you, my friend, today you'll be with me in paradise. He is comforting the guy beside him. And the third word Jesus sent to his mother, woman. This is your son, John. Then he said to the disciple, John, this is your mother. He was concerned about his mother. Think about this. This was the last time. He was suffering a lot. But he was taking care of others. Think about the service. Some people... D.A. Carson says that when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, this was like a, a, a new crucifixion. This was a cross in miniature. Because the same spirit, the same attitude that led Jesus to wash his disciples' feet, was the attitude that led him to the cross. Humiliation. Concerning about others. And then we have the second aspect. The Gospel of John says that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We serve what we love. It's impossible to really serve like Jesus without loving like Jesus. Sorry. It's possible to serve without loving. But it's impossible to love without serving. You can serve moved by other interests. You can serve based on, hey, I think this is a good thing for me to serve this person. Because you are aiming for something else. But when you love, you care about others. He loved his disciples. These guys were his family. Lack of service attests lack of love and also maturity. When he says here, he loved them to the end, we can understand. He loved them to the point of. And maybe we can say, I love, but please, don't me ask this. Hey, Lord, people are in need of some 
help at the church. Touch my brother's heart. Touch my sister's heart. But don't ask me. I love you, but please. Not at this point. Jesus, having loved these, his own who were in the world, he loved them to the point of, he loved them completely, perfectly, extremely. And then the third aspect we have here, when the devil had a red put it into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him, hey, here we have a problem, Houston. It's easy to serve our friends. But what if you know that this one you are serving is Judas? And Jesus knew that. The text is very clear and explicit here in saying that Jesus washed Judas' feet. I don't know about you, but this is very difficult. Jesus knew that these men would betray him, but he still washed his feet. Instead of resent and allow any root of bitterness grow in his heart, Jesus spent his energy to serve. And the problem is that many of us give up serving after a disappointment. Oh, I don't agree with you. Oh, this was very, very sad. I don't like you. So I'm, 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 I'm out. I quit. We give up serving when we have disappointments. But Jesus is our example. He served someone that betrayed him. I remember when I was talking to Pastor Jaime, and he was talking to me about an occasion when he was in a training with Samaritan's Purse. And there was a doctor from Iraq. And this doctor was talking that uh, in that hospital, they used to attend uh, soldiers uh, from ISIS. And there was a violent situation where this soldier was hurt. And there was this Christian doctor making a surgery to remove the bullet of this soldier, this terrorist. And just beside him, there was the woman and the kid that he had shot. And this doctor was making a surgery uh, in these three people. The woman with the kid and the soldier. And this doctor confessed what I am doing here. <laughs> Maybe it's best to kill this guy. But he was serving a soldier from ISIS. So Jesus is just repeating what he already said. And we had a series on the Sermon on the Mount. When he said, love your enemies. He is doing this with Judas. Washing. See, some scholars, they say that it's very, very reasonable to think that Judas did not attend or participate the communion time. When Jesus broke uh, and uh, offered communion. But Jesus served. So the great lesson I see here is that sometimes we don't need to have communion or fellowship to serve. We don't need to agree because we are not serving for them, for the sake of these people. We are serving for the sake of our calling to serve to Jesus. You don't need to have communion or fellowship to serve. This is the third aspect. And then the fourth, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and he was going back to God. Jesus knew, Jesus had the eternity in mind. 
He knew what, who he was. The Father had given all things into his hands. And then the text says, he arose and washed the feet of his disciples. Wow! Jesus is uh, talking here about uh, servant leadership. And there's a very good quote based on that, saying that if serving is below you, leadership is beyond you. Because the leader is the one who serves. The leader is the one who makes the biggest sacrifice. Jesus is saying, I am your leader, but see where I am? I am here washing your feet. We need leaders that are able to serve others. So there are four aspects here about the circumstance where Jesus served. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. When the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray him, and knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. These are the circumstances. And do you know what I learned with that? I learned that we serve if. But Jesus serves despite. Many times we are like STP servants. Do you know what is STP? If you had high school, standard temperature and pressure. In Portuguese, CNTP, Condições Normais de Temperatura e Pressão. If everything is good, normal, I serve. If it's not too cold, if it's not too hot, if, it, if I am not sick, if I am not sad, if I am not offended or disappointed, if I agree with, if I like this person, if I am sure that this person deserves, if, 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 okay, I'll serve. We are STP servants, and Jesus is all in servant. He serves, period. And when we are called to be his followers, disciples, we are called to serve. Look what Jesus says, finishing here. Do you understand what I have done for you, to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, Lord, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And Paul will say to the Philippians, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And Peter will say, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. So, Jesus is not only our Savior. He is our Master. He is our example. We should live for them and like for him and like him. Service is not an obligation. Service is a privilege. When we have a need, we should have a fight at the church. Hey, please, let me do this first. Because this is a great privilege. We have three lessons for today. Number one, every disciple is a deacon. Every disciple is a servant. 
every disciple is a minister. Number two, service is the measure of maturity. It's possible that you think that you are a mature Christian. But the way we see if you are mature or not is through your service. And then through your willingness to serve others. Because when you, you are a baby, we need to serve you. But when you grow up, the question is, who are you serving? Who are you feeding? And then the third one, Jesus is the measure of service. Remember about when he washed his disciples' feet. That attitude should be ours. We should serve in that circumstances. So the final question here is, ask, how can I help? This is a question for you this week. Think about that. Every time, every day you wake up, think about this. Lord, how can I help? In your neighborhood? In your home? Workplace? At the church? Think about that. How can I follow Jesus serving in my context where I am? Doesn't matter if this is only at the church. But ask, how can I help? I will show you uh, a video. And this is a, a closing, an example for us to think when we finish this word. And just after the, the video, two minute video, we'll have a last song based on this uh, word, this passage. Then I'll pray to finish, okay? Let's watch the video. Nice glasses. Oh, thanks. I have 2020 vision. I don't really need glasses. Oh. Well, I used to have perfect vision until I caught an eye disease while on the mission field. So, glasses, it's totally worth it. Um, where did you do mission work? I spent an entire week in Africa. Well, I was in Africa for an entire year. It's amazing how much you get to know Jesus when you're there for that long. Where were you in Africa? I rescue orphans from there all the time. Really? I wonder if you rescue them from the orphanages that I build there. I don't think so. Oh, you wouldn't probably know that they're mine. I don't have my name on the building or anything. I prefer to remain anonymous. <laughs> oh, well, I prefer to remain anonymous too, but when you do so much for Jesus like I do, you just can't help but be known. Listen, I have built so many hospitals and churches because I care about the body and the soul. That's nice, but I don't need a church to save souls. I just preach from the side of the mountain, like Jesus. Well, if you had come down off of that mountain, you would know what people really need like I do. Oh, please, like you know what people need. Me and Jesus, we're tight. Look, you guys wouldn't even know Jesus if he came up to you with a sign that said, I'm Jesus. Are you kidding? I've brought more people to Jesus than Jesus. Well, he wouldn't even have a ministry if it wasn't for me. Jesus. What are you doing? Do you love me? Do you really love me? Then follow me. Help us to see that we are just tools in your hands. Help us to see that we are instruments of your grace in this world. Help us to understand that we are called to be servants. And then we grow when we serve. When we humble ourselves. And, to, and, and when we show up. When we present ourselves to you and say, hey... Use me, Lord. Help us, Lord, to overcome 
a consumeristic approach towards religion, towards church, help us to be providers and not only consumers. Help us to overcome our selfishness, our pride. Help us to be like Jesus. If Jesus is our master, our example, help us to follow him in his steps. Please, Lord, humble us and help us to serve you and to serve the ones that you sent to us. We want to be not the best church in terms of offering the best services, but we want to be a church with great opportunities to serve and to grow. Please, Lord, this is what we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.